The agenda this week stared down corruption, recalled BlackBerry's epic story, looked into computer bias, got a status report on women on corporate boards in Ontario, and sized up the province's energy sector. The agenda's week in review begins with the trouble with Brazil. Joining us now for a look at Brazil, in Washington, D.C., Monica de Bulli, a fellow at the Peterson Institute for International Economics and a professor at the School of Advanced International Studies at Johns Hopkins University. And here in our studio, Dan Jackson, filmmaker whose documentary, In the Shadow of the Hill, looks at how Brazil's police force dealt with those living in its largest slum in the lead-up to the 2014 World Cup. Dan, it's great to have you here. I've seen the documentary. It's just fantastic. Congratulations on getting that done. Monica, uh, I'm uh, happy to have you on TVO with us tonight as well. And let's share these facts about Brazil before uh, we have our discussion here. Population north of 200 million people in Brazil, a GDP of 1.8 trillion. The growth rate? No, sorry, no growth. Declining, minus 3% last year. The population below the poverty line is more than one in five people, all of that according to the CIA World Factbook. Dan, sit tight for a second because I just want to talk to Monica off the top here and get uh, sort of an update on the political nature of Brazil's crisis right now. Uh, the, the president of Brazil is in the process of being impeached and the country is in political turmoil right now. Monica, just give us some of the background. Why has this happened? Well, there are a number of reasons. Um, the, first, the first and most important reason is that there have been a number of things that have come to light um, with respect to you know, the, the, the president and her um, involvement in several things, including um, possibly, though this is not the basis of the impeachment petition, but possibly um, some links to the corruption scandal coming out of the oil company Petrobras. The basis of the impeachment petition, however, has to do with violation of Brazil's fiscal responsibility laws. Um, but it's important to understand that all of this comes at a time when the president's um, approval ratings are at an all-time low. Um, obviously, part of that is because of the economy and the fact that, you know, as, as you mentioned before, the country's in recession, unemployment is extremely high, it has already reached double digits, it's at 11 percent in Brazil, um, wages are falling. So in other words, um, people are suffering, and this is, this is of course, a direct um, reflection of the president's lack of popularity. But this is not just a popularity context. I mean, in, 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 in a lot of ways, there is um, a lot of um, dissatisfaction with respect to the president herself and to her involvement, you know, direct or indirect, in this whole scandal that swamped the country in the last year and a half. Corruption is a theme that obviously runs through politics in Brazil. And Dan, as you show in your documentary, it runs through law enforcement as well. We want to show a clip from your documentary, and, uh, and then we'll come back and chat about that, okay? Sheldon, if you would, let's roll that, please. Informação importante, o perfil são, em geral, jovens, negros, pardos, do sexo masculino, moradores de comunidade pobre. Eu estou defendendo é, que a polícia hoje, ela desaparece mais com as mortes, porque não entra numa estatística de morte da polícia, mas no desaparecido. Tem um depoimento de um policial recente que ele diz exatamente isso. A gente não deixa mais o rastro do crime. Leva para o Rio e joga, joga fora. Just some spectacular shots in that uh, documentary of yours, Dan. Thanks, uh, tell, us, uh, tell us more, first of all, about where your documentary is located. It's located in Rio de, Janeiro, Rio de Janeiro's most populous slum, Rocinha, which is actually straddled by two of Rio de Janeiro's most wealthy suburbs. Those high shots that you take of it, though, bright, beautiful, colored homes, it, it, it looks gorgeous. 
uh, you'd never know that it was a slum where people are really living cheek by jowl, right? It, it's certainly a very picturesque place from, from certain angles, but once you get deep into the community, you, you, know, you see quite plainly the other side of, exis of existence in the community. Now, we talked about political corruption with Monica, but this is clearly corruption based around uh, what the police claim is an attempt by them to rid the community that you focused on here of drug traffickers who they say run amok in there. Mm. What have you found out about whether that's an accurate claim? Well, I mean, I mean, the pacification programs were um, were put into place shortly after the announcement that Brazil would host the World Cup and, and shortly thereafter the, the Summer Olympics. Now, essentially what happened was the police went into a number of Brazil's favelas and... What's a favela? A favela is a, a, it's a slum, essentially. Um, to to uh, set up a permanent presence in there and to um, you know, get the get the drug traffickers out of the territory. Essentially, it was it was all about reclaiming territory. You've got your cameras in the streets and you've got the police coming in, guns a blazing. You can hear the shooting going on quite frequently. Mm. What's it like to live there under those circumstances? Well, uh, to be completely honest, I had a fantastic time living there. I'm, I'm not going to try to glamorise it. There are some very um, very negative sides of life in the favela. There, there are quite constant shootouts at times. I mean, the security situation there undul undulates quite ferociously. Like, sometimes you'll go to sleep with the rattling of machine guns on a nightly basis, and other times you'll go for months uh, without hearing a single gunshot. So there is a huge ebb and flow of the security situation within the community. But on the other side, it, what I found was an extremely welcoming community. Um, there was a real sense of community spirit there and, and you feel that when you walk in and, and I felt very welcomed from the outset. Corruption is now undoubtedly the single greatest threat to the viability of democracies, to national security and to the rights of all mankind. Not terrorism. Not terrorism. International terrorism would be impossible without the corruption which provides the financial backbone to finance ter terrorist organisations. Until 2010, the BBC conducted a worldwide survey uh, of, of citizens across the globe to find out what are the citizens of the world talking about. The single most discussed subject on the planet, more than, uh, more than religion, more than politics, more than war and peace, more than jobs in the economy, was corruption. Corruption is now the, the main driver of terrorism, the main driver of, of war and famine. It is the source of most of the miseries that beset the human race. Let's continue around our table here. Anita, what's your view on that? I think in this respect, you need to look at which jurisdiction we're talking about. Mm -hmm. Canada and the United States, although there are corrupt companies without question, uh, have a very strong uh, securities and corporate law regime. Enforcement of the laws on the books is always an issue, uh, but in, in terms of the comprehensiveness of the legal regime, uh, we stand in fairly good stead. So in your view, not everybody is on the take. I think we need to be specific about what we're talking about when we use the word corruption and when we use uh, the words uh, enforcement and which country in particular we're talking about is very important. Well, as a matter of fact, we do happen to have a little list here. Sheldon, can we do this now? Let's go, here's a list. This is, Alicia, your organization that puts this out. Mm -hmm. uh, the Transparency International Organization puts a list out of the least corrupt countries. We should all move to Denmark. They're just <laughs> wonderful there. Denmark, number one, Finland, Sweden, New Zealand, Netherlands, Norway, Switzerland, Singapore. There we are at number nine, which is not bad if you consider maybe 200 plus countries in the world, we're number nine. Germany, Luxembourg, the UK, the US incidentally at number 16. Uh, okay, so you guys study this. How corrupt is the world based on your latest findings? Well, Transparency International has been around for over 20 years. The Canadian chapter has been around for almost 20 years. The fight against corruption continues and it's not getting any easier. And those findings show only part of the story. Uh, the fact that we are ninth least corrupt country in the world does not mean that we do not have corruption problems. We also have uh, an index called Global Corruption Barometer, which looks at public perceptions of corruptions. And for instance, 62% of Canadians in our uh, 2013 study thought that political parties were corrupt in Canada. Hmm. Okay, Martin, you've done a little reporting on this. Would you like to 
equate what's been going on related to political fundraising at Queen's Park with corruption? Sure. I, I think I think Yes? That's the, the, a yes? The, sure, I'd like to I'd like to I'd like to talk about it. I wouldn't <laughs> say they're equivalent. I think so much of corruption is perception. That's not to say that there's not a tremendous amount of reality uh, that, that behind it. But it's all relative and it's all geographical. So around the world we've heard about the kinds of corruption that, that takes place. I've seen it in my own reporting overseas when I was uh, abroad for the Toronto Star. But it's relative, and when we, when we talk about what's happening in Canada, I think there's kind of a Canadian corruption paradox. People here really believe there is a tremendous amount of corruption As in, the in Canada, indicate. in Ontario. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that to go from that perception of corruption to, to criminality is a, is a huge leap. Uh, we had the Charbonneau Commission in Quebec, which looked at, at uh, corruption in Quebec. And it found a lot of leads and a lot of interesting material. But the amount of actual corruption in Quebec was relatively slim, at least in terms of what we've found. In Ontario, there hasn't really been any smoking gun. That's not to say that there isn't the potential for corruption. And I think, to go back to your question about fundraising, I think that's what people are afraid of, is that uh, corruption can be human nature, and temptation is a very powerful force. And if we do have fundraising laws that are lax and that allow companies and unions and other ent entities or even large donors to contribute a large amount of money. There is obviously a temptation, there is a perception, and there is a risk. And just briefly, before I forget this, in the last progressive conservative leadership race uh, a year or so ago, one donor gave $100,000 to one of the candidates, not to Patrick Brown, the current PC leader. He's asked me to keep reminding people that he was not was the recipient was of that. <laughs> but to Christine Elliott, $100,000, and that was legal. Do we know who it was? It's, it's, it's the heir, uh, the son of a forestry baron, if I can use that out, outmoded word, in northern <laughs> Ontario. I forget his name. He had been an intern at, at Queen's Park, much like your interns here at TBO, and had uh, thought, that, thought well of Kristen Elliott. But $100,000, my goodness, how could that possibly happen <laughs> and not have, have implications for perceptions of corruption? Let me read this to you and I'll get your view on this. In former Liberal Cabinet Minister Greg Sorbera's day, the tables at events like the Heritage Dinner, so annual Liberal fundraiser, cost closer to $5,000. But the effect was the same. People would ask him what they would get in return for paying large amounts of money to the governing party. My answer was always the same. What you get is the satisfaction of supporting the democratic process in Ontario, the former finance minister said. How do you think that explanation plays across the broad swath of Ontario? Very poorly. I think that most Ontarians, most Canadians feel that if a corporation is making a payment to anything, um, they're expecting to get, to get a return on investment for their shareholders. And indeed, it is not just the right, it is the responsibility of a CEO making an expenditure to only make that expenditure if he can justify it to his shareholders by saying, there is some material benefit to you for, for me doing that. And that's why I think it, it is so important and has been so valuable for the federal government of Canada to ban corporate and union contributions and to cap contributions by individuals. And I'm heartened to see that the government of Ontario is likely to follow suit. Every, because, every government, though, Akash, always says, I defy you to find a smoking gun. I defy you to say that contribution begat that policy change which benefited this company. Fair to say? Uh, it's fair to say that everyone makes that argument. I think it's also fair to say that it is almost impossible in the complex world of public policy development to, to trace cause and effect even when it is a virtuous cause and effect. Ultimately, there are two questions. First of all, our companies, let's say for the sake of argument that all political actors are paragons of virtue. Nevertheless, corporations are making those donations in the hopes that they will purchase influence. Otherwise, there is no point to making it. And secondly, even if corporations themselves were also paragons of virtue, it is sapping public confidence in the, in the political system. How do you know that? One of the reasons why I think that Canadians feel that, that Canada is, does have a corrupt system up, above and beyond any evidence to the contrary, is the fact that there is this constant drip feed of stories in the press about large contributions. And I do think it is fair enough for Canadians to say, what are those people getting in exchange for the money that they're donating? Moreover, the fact that the, political, the federal <coughs> political system has worked extremely well without corporate contributions demonstrates that corporate and large individual contributions are not necessary to maintain our democracy. Mm -hmm. In 14 short years, you write, Lazaridis and Balsali had steered Rim from the obscurity of a small Ontario city to claim the title as the new kings of technology 
with an inventive smartphone that was a must-have status symbol for professionals. Contrasting personalities that might have driven Lazaridis and Balsali apart during the stressful fight to survive instead united them into a stronger force against RIM's adversaries. By its 2006 fiscal year, the company's revenue exceeded $2 billion. Did they look unstoppable at the time? Absolutely. They were unstoppable even when Steve Jobs had introduced the iPhone. They were then a $20 billion company. I mean, this company that started above a bagel store in Waterloo has taught us that you can create a $20 billion global company. Where they ran into trouble was that why they were scaling to keep up with that incredible demand internationally in India, Indonesia, you name it, they were hot. Africa, their foundations were being eroded by Apple. And Did they not see that threat by the, when it presented by itself? By 2009, 2010, they could see it. Hmm. But what do you do? Do you go to your board of directors and say this thing that's worth $20 billion, we're going to have to drop it and focus on something completely different. We're going to have to take the wrath of the stock market for backing away from this $20 billion market. These are tough calls. Yeah. And the board was not a very strong board in the sense that they had limited technology experience. They were seasoned Canadian businessmen and women who really didn't understand technology or Silicon Valley. And between that and Mike and Jim, it made, it, it made the, the decision that needed to be made in retrospect very difficult. Beyond that, Jackie, they got into uh, some real big-time trouble. They got dinged for hundreds of millions of dollars in fines for patent infringement. They got dinged by the Ontario Securities Commission for cheating to take excess profits, backdating some of the stock what options. The stock yeah. options. That's where they were. What happened to the Mike and Jim partnership as the sky seemed to be falling in on them? Well, this is where the story becomes Shakespearean because you have this great partnership, this great success, two men who didn't particularly uh, enjoy each other's company outside of work um, became um, horribly divided over the stock options scandal. And each of them has their own perspective. Each of them has their own sense of betrayal. The upshot is, is that Mike had to go before the SEC to be interrogated and you know, face the prospect of yet another humiliation after the, pat the patent case, mm -hmm. which you referred to. Um, and he blamed Jim, who oversaw the financing and the stock option decisions. So Jim for thought this. he threw him under the bus. Jim felt he was thrown under the bus. He not only that, he said, he felt he felt that Mike didn't appreciate all that he'd done for the company. Mm -hmm. And this is what happens when you got your back against the wall and you've been like the Stanley Cup team for six seasons in a row and suddenly you're bums. Mm -hmm it becomes very hard to hold the best of relationships together. They fell horribly apart. You ended up in a situation where the company was run by two CEOs that really didn't speak to each other a great deal, mm -hmm. and two silos and two groups of people that are trying to make, make either Mike happy or Jim happy. And so when you've got to pivot and change to adjust to the communication, and both CEOs have a different idea, Mike wanting to keep the handsets, and Jim wanting to move into you know, SMS.2, the, you know, the texting, the mm -hmm. Blackberry, uh, uh, you know, instant messaging that became very big a couple of years later. BBMs. Right. Yeah. So who was the board going to back? The guy that got fingered for the stock option scandal? The guy who was, you know, had a tough personality? Or the guy who made the handsets that they loved? Hmm. The storm was supposed to save everything. Yeah. What happened with Storm? Storm was the phone that Verizon wanted. It wanted to have the iPhone killer. And so they, they were the big carrier, and they anointed BlackBerry to create the iPhone killer. And Mike went down to New York with BlackBerry Bold, which had yet to come out, and said, this is the way of the future. And they said, no, get rid of the keyboard. And they were looking at the greatest opportunity of their business career. And Verizon said, give us this phone in two months. We want. want a touch screen. They'd never done that. They didn't have the applications. They were, they were about to launch the Bold and a bunch of other phones as well. So they had to do this within nine months. And Mike's idea was, we want to create the tactile experience of a BlackBerry so that when you click the touch screen, there's actually a little pivot underneath and you can hear the click. And that decision made sense at the time. When they machined these phones, they worked. But when they mass produced them, it was a disaster. I believe the return rate on these phones was 99%. They also tried to compete with uh, iPad with a little, what do they call it, the playbook? The playbook, yeah. That didn't go well either. No, you know, think of this uh, in retrospect. They raced to be in that business. They saw tablets as a future. They now understood screens. They'd learned from Storm. They launched the playbook without the native email application. Mm -hmm. And Mike, to this day, thinks that that makes sense because you didn't have to have two separate plans. You could have your playbook, tether your 
BlackBerry to it, and away you went. Well, the average person that loved BlackBerry is going, well, where's the app that connects me wirelessly to my email? Mm. It wasn't there. And that was sort of you know, one of the last nails in the coffin in terms of the public perception of the reliability of this company and the great sense that they were cutting edge and ahead of their time. That was Mike's bad call. Jim's bad call, I guess, was not appreciating the just explosive desire that the public had for ever more applications uh, to go on the device. So BlackBerry really doesn't run that many apps anymore, does it? It does, but to be fair to them, there was a reason that they had that mindset. And that is that when they were starting as carry, you know, with the carriers, they were starting with uh, Bell South and a, and a number of other carriers, at very limited networks, and their preoccupation was crashing and you know the network's going down. So they wouldn't let them have apps. And BlackBerry used to put sneaker apps in when they would do software upgrades. Mm. And they would light up the system, more traffic would go through, and they would get phone calls from the from the carriers who ruled the world. Steve Jobs called them the four orifices because you couldn't get anything <laughs> down their pipelines without their permission. And Steve Jobs rewrote the rules, you know, and, and created one of the greatest wealth transfer, transfers of all time away from the carriers to Apple, which is now many times the size of all the carriers together. Of course, one of the things they're doing with that information is marketing stuff back to us that they think we'll be interested in based on what they know about us. What's the harm in that? You know, the marketing uh, fingerprint here is a, is a really interesting one. When you think about how essentially there are so many firms out there that are trying to gather data points about us to figure out exactly what to market to us. Um, there was recently a report by the Federal Trade Commission um, called Big Data, a tool for inclusion or exclusion. And what it stated was that very often there can be marketing directed to vulnerable consumers. So for example, there was a data broker list that referred to the gullible elderly, and that could be purchased by casinos, who say want to target people that may want to just get rich quick. There are also lists out there of people who suffer from bipolar disorder. And so if you worry about, for example, mental health disorders being something that an unscrupulous marketer could target in order to uh, provoke certain behavior by individuals, that would be a big concern. Well, let's take this to the next level, if you were, uh, if you will, rather. And uh, this was really quite disturbing when I read this in your book. Some data marketing companies have profiles of people with identifying characteristics, and I'll quote a few here. Probably bipolar, or daughter killed in car crash, or rape victim, or, and one you talked about earlier, gullible elderly. A uh, few questions here. Does a person, for example, labeled as a rape victim have any way to A, know about it, or B, do something about it if that's what is online about them? Unfortunately, many of these companies are based in the United States, and thanks to very expansive interpretations of our free expression clause of our Constitution uh, in the First Amendment, oftentimes there's very little people can do in terms of uh, if this is framed as an opinion about them. If it's reported as a fact, technically they could sue for defamation if it's wrong, right? You could, you could go after them. But the problem people face practically is there are at least 4,000 data brokers that are maintaining this type of information or other controversial information. And even if you went to 10 a day and demanded your profile, and first of all, many of them won't even give you the profile, but let's say that you know, they did decide to do so, even if you had 10 a day that you went after, you'd still have 400 left at the end of the year that you wouldn't know what the information was about you. So we really do live in a world where you've got these sort of star chambers, these secret dossiers about everybody that are circulating among in these data brokers, and who knows where they'll be used next. Let's continue with an excerpt from your book. We're calling this Subjectivity as Science. Technocrats and managers cloak contestable value judgments in the garb of, quote, science. Thus, the insatiable demand for mathematical models that reframe subtle and subjective conclusions as the inevitable dictate of data. If these models can reflect subjective views, can they, for example, going on a bit of a limb here, but let's see, can they be racist? I think they can, and I'll give a very practical example of this. Um, there was a advertising algorithm that was matching up ads when people's names were searched. And an African-American computer science named, scientist named Latanya Sweeney was upset to find that when she would search for herself on Google, the ad would come up and say, 
Latanya Sweeney, colon, arrested, question mark. Then she just, you know, on a lark, typed in Tanya Sweeney, and then the ad said, Tanya Sweeney, we found her, or something like that. And this was for a background check service. And what she was essentially uh, suspic suspecting was that names that were often associated with African Americans were being associated online with uh, an arrest question, whereas other names were not. And she did confirm that. She did empirical research that confirmed that. And I think that's a real problem, you know, because I think that this type of thing is something that can happen in many different areas. People may not even be intending it, but it may just reflect user behavior, which is also problematic. Ontario is now an explain or comply jurisdiction. That is, ensure you have women on your corporate boards or tell the Ontario Securities Commission why you do not. Jennifer Reynolds is CEO of Women in Capital Markets and she joins us now to tell us what's keeping women out of these positions and what can be done to fix that. Jennifer, good to meet you and nice to have you here at TVO. Thank you. Let's put some stats up first of all. This is from the Ontario Security Commission's report from September of 2015. And they found at the OSC that about half of the 722 TSX companies had no women on their boards, zero. And 40% had none in an executive position. This is the first report the TXX, TSX companies have done since they became obligated to disclose those numbers. And I guess I wonder, for starters, is this kind of what you expected? Honestly, it was worse than I expected. Worse? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think it's shocking when you just put it in front of people, that transparency, that disclosure uh, is shocking. I mean, a further 30% of boards only have one woman. Uh, so it is, I think it's quite shocking. And I think people in Canada actually would be surprised to know that we rank globally uh, very poorly when it comes to gender diversity and leadership. And I think we think of ourselves as a very diverse, inclusive culture here in Canada. Well, we are. Except... Not, not in corporate Canada. Not in corporate not Canada. Not in the boardroom. Hmm. The, the new rules, which uh, basically, quote unquote, say comply or explain. Mm -hmm. Explain what that means. Basically, they're asking, do you have a policy around encouraging gender diversity uh, in leadership on your board, in the executive suite as well? Uh, if you don't have that, you know, why do you not have it? What is your explanation for that? Uh, and so, we, unfortunately, what happened is only 14% of companies actually have a policy, a written policy, uh, around gender diversity in the boardroom, and the rest of them didn't. So very few actually have a written policy today in Canada. And is the idea that the more this is publicized, the more companies will feel embarrassed to do something That's about exactly it? exactly what it is. Shame them. Yeah, it's transparency, right? <laughs> yeah. You put the numbers out there. And we saw, actually, in the UK, they used a similar regime, uh, Comply or Explain there, and started it uh, back in 2012. Their numbers were very poor. They had about 12 and a half percent of their board seats were filled by women at that point. They put it out there, but they also had behind it an annual report, the Lord Davies report, it was called. And so it was, it was a report on how are we doing? And at the back, there was a list of exactly where everybody stood in terms of the companies and, and how many women they had on their boards. And so now today, they're up over 25%. So they, they met their, their goal of where they wanted to be at this point and at the end of 2015. So I think it can work, but uh, I think it can, you, need, you do have to have a bit of that shame and you know you're doing nothing about this and you have zero women and there's no doubt in your mind that the reason they got from where they were to where they are is because of this I think there was a few different things going on there. There was the regulation, certainly. Uh, people all of a sudden had to report on this. Uh, and then also there was this Lord Davies report that was pushing people. There was a group of chairs and directors that were, were put together by um, a, a thing called the 30% Club, uh, which aspirationally people signed on, these directors and chairs saying, we want to get to 30% over five years. So there was a whole movement on various fronts to push this forward, which in Canada, I think today, we do have the 30% here, it just launched, um, but we don't have a lot of the, the push that we saw in the UK yet behind the disclosure requirements. What is the explanation that Corporate Canada gives for why the numbers of women represented on their boards is so bad? It's, it's pretty embarrassing, actually. Those that didn't have policies said that they only appoint on merit. So what those companies are saying is that they couldn't find one woman for 50% of the boards in this country who merited a board seat. So, you know, that's, that's a red herring. Clearly, there are lots of women who merit these board seats. So They're what's just not looking. What's really going on then? Well, I mean, the way it works in, in the corporate world, certainly at the board level, is that people appoint people they know. They appoint people they're already on boards with. They appoint people from their network. And if you're a 60, 70-year-old man, 
chances are you know a lot of 60 or 70 year old men and those are the people that end up getting on boards. There isn't really real robust processes around board appointments unfortunately and so that's another thing that hopefully this will bring about. It forces boards to actually look outside their network and actually say you know do our, you know can I if I go to a recruiter if I go outside of my own network are there qualified women and they're finding yes there are. Here's how we get power in the province of Ontario, this in 2015. The biggest chunk, as you can see, Minister, up, well, you know all this stuff already. 60% of our electricity is from nuclear, and then we go all around from hydro, which is about a quarter, gas and oil, wind, biofuels, and solar, still very, very small. That's 60% nuclear number. Is that the appropriate number? Yes, that how is come? the appropriate number. It's the appropriate number because uh, it's, it's, it's called base electricity. That's the electricity that is generated 24 hours a day, usually, <clears throat> overnight, etc. Nuclear is very difficult to ramp up and down quickly. So you know you have the, the operator, the system, the independent electricity system operator. Mm -hmm. they, have to, they have to match generation and consumption uh, throughout the whole system, and it's a very complicated process. Uh, so um, the, the nuclear is stable. Not only is it stable, we've just agreed to refurbish uh, 10 nuclear units, almost 10,000 megawatts at Darlington and at Bruce Power. I'm going to get to that in a second. Yes. Before, you, before you go there, I, I, you know, you've seen what's happening in Germany, right? They've decided that they're going to get out of the nuclear business altogether. Yes. So I guess a lot of Ontarians are wondering whether it is right and appropriate for us to be as dependent on nuclear as we clearly are. Well, I certainly wouldn't want to make the decision Germany made because uh, they almost got rid of dirty coal uh, using nuclear, and now they're going back to dirty coal. So mm -hmm. they're 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 making their their citizens sick by creating that pollution. We are we are emissions free uh, almost in Ontario now. We're at about 92, 93 uh, percent. We're saving four billion dollars a year in environmental and health care costs by eliminating cheap coal. So the reason why uh, Germany is moving off is because of Fukushima, uh, the, the, uh, the, the problem in Japan with their nuclear units as a result of the tsunami. Um, and uh, we, we have a very, very strong, safe, reliable nuclear sector here, among the best in the world, if not the best. We have not had any major problems in terms of public safety in over 50 years of operation. So it's safe, it's reliable, but it's emissions free. So when we're going into a world of climate change, it's emissions free. 60% is coming from nuclear. Yeah. Here's what Bradley Yock from the Consumer Policy Institute has to say, and then I'll get your feedback on his comments. He wrote in the Financial Post that demand for power in Ontario continues to decline. High price generators continue to be added to the grid. The province's surplus of power is growing larger and Queen's Park has used the legislature rather than an economic test to push through the refurbishment of the Darlington nuclear plant that will, if history is an indicator, go wildly over budget. The result will be a leveraged electricity sector pumping out vast amounts of expensive electricity that isn't needed, or conversely, the system will be paying generators to sit idle. Your view. First of all, it's not expensive. The average price over the next 30 years from, from both Darlington and Bruce will be about 7.7 .7 cents per kilowatt hour into the grid. That's extremely reasonable as a price. It's emissions free in the area of uh, trying to reduce, uh, reduce carbon. It's an economic generator, 60,000 people working in, in the refurbishment and in the sector over a period of about uh, 10 to 12 years. Uh, it's extremely reliable. Um, and in terms of budgeting, uh, with respect to Bruce Power, uh, Every single dollar over budget from the refurbishment will be paid by Bruce Power. If these projects, as history has indicated and as Brady suggests in his piece, if these projects go over budget and over time, who's on the hook? Well, let me give you an actual case. Bruce Power already did refurbishment. They were, I think, two and a half or three billion dollars over budget and they had to eat all the costs. Now, Bruce Power is a consortium of uh, different owners, which includes Omers and TransCanada and uh, uh, Bruce Power itself. So, so it, it's uh, so the risk was 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 uh, was absorbed by the generator. In terms of Darlington, that's different. They, it's not a consortium. It's 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 uh, it's an agency of the provincial government. Mm -hmm. uh, we have built in uh, off ramps. In other words. 
there's six units being built at, uh, at the Bruce, four units being built at Darlington, and we're doing them sequentially. So if we get into trouble and uh, there are budgetary issues, we have an off-ramp where we can move out of it. Well, so you say we're, not, we're, not, we're, not, we're not married to doing the whole four units. We're not on the hook for the whole four units. And that is the Agenda's Week in Review. You can see all of those programs in their entirety on our website, that's tvo.org, on our iTunes channel, and on our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash the agenda. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit supporttvo.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.